it was definitely the cocaine cigarettes that really brought intense heat on John Marks. The headlines you can imagine were NHS doctor prescribes crack. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, I'm Ben Boyce. Today's episode features a conversation with fellow researcher and educator Toby Seddon. And we cover a ton in just over an hour, including Dr. Marx's heroin clinics, where he prescribed amphetamine, cocaine, and heroin, among other drugs, to drug users in England between 1985 and 1992. And we also talk about drugs, specifically, what makes a drug a drug? And how do we go about constantly redefining those things on both an individual and a cultural level? And since I'm a communication guy, we wound up framing the entire conversation in Foucault's ideas about human governance in forms of political power, which is way more exciting than it sounds. At least I think it is. And it should help bring these topics together in the end. You can check out Toby's work at the links in the episode description including a great podcast he does where he talks a lot more about, among other things, Dr. Marx's drug clinics. With that, I give you Toby Seddon. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and do this. I've been pouring through like the tip of the iceberg of work that's making me feel inferior. So <laughs> it's always nice to read somebody that gives you something to really chew on. So I think we have a ton to talk about that okay. intersects on lo uh, lots of different angles of what I do between drugs and communication. I'm almost positive this doesn't work the other way. When somebody comes on a show in the U.S. and has a, a English accent of any sort, just as like two extra points right from the get, people are like, oh, there must be something worth listening to here. <laughs> so. Really? I don't know. The, the podcast was just a kind of um, COVID-driven thing of, oh, I just want to do some different stuff while I'm stuck at home. Why don't yeah. I see if I can do this? So I haven't done a lot because I just don't have time with the day job, but it, yeah, I've enjoyed it. it. I like I like the different skills of working out how to do good interviews and uh, editing and so on. Apologies yeah, I, for my dog. I have a feeling everybody's going to have one as cliche as that sounds. And I have been saying that for a year, but for the last six months, it's like every day I stumble into somebody else that's entered this, I guess the digital commons is sort of the new term that's I've heard applied to it that sort of makes sense. I think yeah. we're just moving towards a world where people want to use whatever senses they want to use to tune in. It's great in teaching, actually, because students, well, some students really engage with text, obviously, but a lot of students, to be able to listen to something really works well for them. So I'm, I'm increasingly including podcasts on reading lists for students, and um, a lot of them really love it and find it a, a better way to sort of engage with, with ideas and so on. So, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it's good. Yeah, wait till you get stuck in the rabbit hole of adding visual to it. Because a couple times I've realized, well, if I could just put a you know a few slides and some video and cut and paste, and a podcast can turn into a twenty minute YouTube video. That yeah, you well, got to sign that too, right? <laughs> my my son says to me, um, you should do get get your thing up on YouTube and put some visuals up. But I that's a step too far for me. I can't do it. Yeah, in that world, it comes with the bad as much as it comes with the good as we enter the world where almost anybody can amplify their voice. And we haven't really cleaned this crap up yet. So no. I know podcasting has its own group of bizarros that are sort of not doing us any favors. But my God, social media and YouTube and it sort of is the worst of us right now. Yeah, I, uh, I don't dabble in it too much and try to restrict it for work stuff rather than personal and keep the two separate as much yep. as humanly possible. Let's start with who you are and what you do. My name's Toby, Toby Seddon. I'm at the moment a professor of social science at University College London in England, where I teach social science and do research primarily on social policy issues, which for me are focused around drug use, drug laws, um, drug law reform, criminal justice, penal system, those kinds of areas. And I've been doing this work in those sorts of areas for 
about 25 years in various different places, starting off working for various charities, doing more sort of research and evaluation and policy work, and then moving into academia, working for universities back in 2004, I think was the first time. So yeah, that's who I am. So I haven't been able to find this scour as I may. Why this field? Well, I suppose it's quite prosaic, really, rather than an exciting reason. But I think there are probably two things. So the first reason is a very instrumental one. So back in 1993, I had just finished doing a graduate program in criminology and was looking for a job and wanted to do something around research and policy in the sort of broad social policy realm. And at that time in the UK, things weren't great job-wise. So there was quite high unemployment, quite high graduate unemployment, and it was really hard to get any sort of job. So I think I applied for about 70 different jobs. And eventually the one I got was for a charity, which no longer exists, called ISDD in London, which did drug information and policy work and had been set up in in the late 60s. And the particular project I was recruited to work on as a research assistant was around drug users in the criminal justice system. So the sort of initial entry into this was really purely that was the job I got. And then as I worked in that job, I stayed there for a couple of years I sort of realized that one of the things around thinking about drug use and drug policy is that it's a way into pretty much every possible aspect of the social world and of policy that you could ever wish to explore. So you can, if you're interested in health, you know, there's lots to go on. If you're interested in inequalities, social justice, housing, gender, um, consumption, capitalism, international affairs, foreign policy, war, you know, you name it, everything is there and you can, gives you a way in to look at everything. So I just found that I could pursue my interests in the things that to me are important by looking at, at it through the drugs lens as it were so that i think that's that's how i've ended up in it and obviously over time you sort of accumulate a bit of expertise and a reputation so the opportunities come to you people will say oh would you like to write a chapter for my collection on x and it then becomes hard to get away from it <laughs> not that i particularly want to because i think it's really really important but also eternally fascinating just because it's got a bit of everything there, really. That's another interesting link. I found myself repeatedly thinking as I was reading through your work that it sort of maps on to a lot of what I've been speaking in another way that we'll get to today, but you're really bringing power in systems and the way that human beings work into this conversation and just you know laying out this natural progression. And you said you mentioned you teach, and that's great because I added a question that before we talk about what is a drug, you've written this fabulous paper that's linked on the episode description if anybody wants to read it. That's about the genealogy of the term drugs. So what's your quick way to explain to undergrads? What is a genealogy? A genealogy, it's just a tracing of where concepts or ideas or practices come from. So think of it as like drawing the family tree, the genealogy. Um, So it's really about tracing back the different branches of how things have come to be as they are now, recognizing that where things are now is itself just a snapshot rather than necessarily an end point. Things change all the time. And, you know, it's hard as a human being because we live relatively short lives in the context of human history. So things can feel like they've existed this way forever. So this is one of the points of that paper is that for most people, you would think, well, you know, the idea of a drug, it's it's probably always existed, hasn't it? Haven't we always had this idea? It doesn't feel like something terribly new that's just been 
fashioned. And of course, when you do the genealogy, trace the family tree, you find this quite, well, to me, surprising story that actually, if you go back only 150, 200 years, and you started talking about drugs the way we are today, no one would have known what on earth you were talking about, because it meant something different. So that's what a genealogy is, that tracing of the family tree, I think. Yeah, with the deliberate intent to figure out, well, how the heck did we get where we're at and where we're going, which is now the first big question, well, then what's a drug? What's a drug? Well, I suppose the short version of that, it is whatever we choose to label as a drug. And what we have chosen to label as a drug is a particular subset of substances that produce various effects on people, intoxication, pleasure, pain relief. And the process of attaching a label, the drug label, is a legal regulatory one that is to do with restricting access and use of that subset of substances. So the the labelling isn't a kind of neutral, separate thing. Things are only labelled that way if we're going to prohibit them. The two things are sort of completely bound up together. And there are other things. I mean, it's a bit of a cliched example, but the obvious parallel substance is alcohol, which on the face of it has all the features of what we think of as a drug, except that we haven't applied that prohibitive label. And we've chosen, not all societies, but many societies have chosen to allow it to be more freely used and and traded. So that's my sort of take on it. Yeah. And not just alcohol, you make another great connection to tea and coffee. And this is something, or caffeine rather, via coffee or at times Coca-Cola. In the US, we had a huge Supreme Court case where Coca-Cola was almost sued out of using caffeine because it was the new drug. Yeah. And how those things were at one point connected as well as tobacco in some way. And something happened that cleaved, that changed things from their substances that we sell that you might think of as uh, capitalistic products. And there is such a thing, you mentioned the verb drug, there's always been this sort of scary idea that you could drug somebody in in an effort to victimize them in various ways. But that the, the splitting of what are we going to call a drug and what are we going to call things that maybe some people would call drugs but aren't has frequently come down to some very clear things. And I mentioned earlier your philosophy maps onto mine very well. I'm always looking, especially in 2020, as the world is like ripping each other's hair out, right, and trying to fight about everything. The safer, easier, more accepting way to get somebody to listen to what I'm saying. And in the United States, as soon as you get to the point where people right now in this conversation say, well, then why are drugs illegal if they weren't? The answer is basically, well, race got involved and we had all you know these pent up and it wasn't just the US, but this is where we really led the way on a lot of these early drug laws. But it isn't just race, it's actually power. It was which drugs seem to pose a moralistic threat in the minds of the people who are in power and which drugs, on the other hand, are not drugs in the sense that they're filling the pockets of the right people and the right regulations are already in place. Now that I've sort of picked at that from various angles, how did we go about choosing and then, as you use this term, decoupling some substances that are certainly dangerous? My God, tons of people die from smoking cigarettes every year, but we don't outlaw them in the the Western world largely. How did we decide that? Yeah, it's a... It's a really interesting question, and it's quite a difficult one to answer, I think, because although there's a sort of origin point in the sense of we can talk about an international drug control system being created, you know, roughly speaking, in the early 20th century, this process of, uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but this process of deciding which things to criminalise and which not continues So it's not that it was just then. We've repeatedly made these decisions and a sort of, I don't know if it's an obvious example, but one that comes to to my mind would be about LSD. There was a set of decisions taken around what we should do about LSD that weren't in the 1920s. This was in the late 1960s. And 
you know, the more recent examples as well. So this is an ongoing set of processes of societies thinking about how they want to regulate different substances. And I guess one of the things that is in common in all of these decision-making processes is that it really counts who is seen to be the people who primarily use the substance. That's a critical thing. It's not the only thing, but it's absolutely critical. And there'll be certain groups where societies are keener and more ready to control those groups than others. You know, this is all all sort of obvious, but that's a key dimension to it. If we go back, though, to you know, what is a, a sort of critical moment in this? So the basically the first couple of decades of the 20th century, where I think we can say that the whole global prohibition system was created in those two decades. And one of the interesting things to note about that period is that essentially that was all really driven by opium. So opium was the concern, not anything else. So things like cocaine and cannabis came later. So they're sort of earlier examples of what I was saying, that we revisit these decisions all the time about different substances. So initially, drug policy was opium policy. And one of the key drivers here was actually China. So I think there is a tendency to think about you know, prohibition as a, a, an American, a US-led phenomenon. And at various points, it is, that's true. But if you go back to this critical point, yes, the US was one of the players and was supportive of China wanting to introduce controls on, on opium. But it's really about China and European empires, particularly the British Empire. They were the kind of key dimensions of that story where in the 19th century two wars had been fought the opium wars to force the chinese to accept opium grown in british controlled india and that was seen to have been really damaging for china and and her people and so by the time we get to the early 20th century they were really arguing to be as they saw it, liberated from the injustices that had happened to them at the hands of of European empires. So it's interesting to me that it's not really an American story right at the start. It's a sort of British, European, Asian story. And it's all about opium. And We were the pushers at the beginning, ironically. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So that's there's a sort of irony now today, isn't there, with fentanyl, where mm. there's a lot of a lot of fentanyl produced in laboratories in China. And I know Trump and Xi Jinping had discussions about, you know, controlling fentanyl and so on. And it's literally the the mirror image of what was happening 120 years yeah. ago. So now Yeah, there's a line that runs through that too. I hadn't again mapping it on. These are stories I've told, but I've told them maybe segmented and not put it all together that we basically pushed opium illegally for much of this and to the point of going to war twice with China to say, we are going to sell you this stuff because we we want your tea and we're tired of giving you silver for it. And then run the the clock forward, we start to see uh, this influx often of Asian workers coming to the United States for the gold rush and for the later for the silver rush in Reno in California and Nevada. First place is to institute drug laws based on not opium, but establishments where these people were smoking this drug. So all of a sudden, they've come here to work, and what the hell? The, the stigma that we've been pushing on them comes with them, and we're like, oh, we can police. It's the moral claim that was made that not only, and this is the, the two things you connect to it, you need a threat to morality, and you need a threat to the social order, and you need to be able to paste both of those things on the chemical, wink, wink, really, the people using it, but we don't want to admit that. It's the chemical, and then those two things seem to be attached to every drug, and as I mentioned, like there's this thread running through. The question I wanted to follow up with on this is how do you start already getting at this? How did tobacco, alcohol, and then later and right now, medical marijuana, legal marijuana in Colorado, regulated pharmaceutical products, and MDMA, which is about to have its heyday, psilocybin is now legal in Colorado, decriminalized where I live, and 
ketamine comes to mind, which is essentially PCP remanufactured to have a shorter half-life. We see rich folks going to doctor's offices here and getting an injection of ketamine and just getting the same buzz you would get at your house. How do these things play into that same thread? Because I think that I see that thread still running through that as we reshape and we rethink what that substance was last year or what that substance was 25 years ago, we have a different idea now. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, isn't it? And uh, the the more I've I've thought about this and written about this, the more I think of it as always in a state of flux. So these characterizations we have and regulatory decisions uh, about different substances, the, these are all quite temporary, really. I mean, you rightly raised the question of psychedelics. That's a great example where... I mean, some of these things have barely even been prohibited for a few decades. You know, it's, it's really recent. And we might, again, the sort of cultural view might be, well, of course, they're criminalized. They're really dangerous, you know, sending people crazy, having hallucinations, jumping off buildings. What are you talking about? Of course, these are criminalized for our own good. Yet that's it's not been that long. And now we're seeing a kind of unraveling of that. So I think that's a great example. But probably the, the other example of how these things are really fluid is cannabis. I mean, this is really quite an interesting case study of, of how fluid these things are. Because I think for many people in Western countries, I would say cannabis is seen as the sort of archetypal illegal drug. It's Mm -hmm. This is what comes to people's minds when they're thinking about drugs and prohibition. It's Something people has smoking changed. weed. And yet cannabis came to the party quite late, as it were, the prohibition party. So in the UK, it wasn't prohibited until, I think, 1928. So that's not even 100 years. Yeah. In the US, as you know better than me, federal prohibition 1937. I mean, yeah, that's 30. not very long ago. No. It's really not very long ago. No. And there's been a sort of undoing of this that, I mean, if we take the US, that I guess you can trace back to something like 1996 and medical yeah. cannabis in yeah. California. And it's sort of built from there to where we are now. And it's still building. Yeah. And it's but now in different places as well. We've just arrived at, I was about to say, uh, Toby was hitting home runs. And I realized, oh, wait, there's not a lot of baseball there. So what's the analogy for a, a goal in a goal in lacrosse, maybe? Yeah, What's the analogy? Goal. Yeah, okay. sticking you're, it in the back of the net. You're sticking it in the... I was hoping we get some of those clever English phrases too. You're sticking yeah. it in the back <laughs> of the net. Uh, you, were, <laughs> you were just nailing it over and over again on communication philosophers that I'm supposed to know better than you, and Foucault was one of them. So we've just arrived at Foucault. You walk right up to two issues that Foucault was constantly taking on, and one of them is what we've just arrived at, the product activity that is required for the status quo and suddenly the changes we're talking about where marijuana has rapidly gone from oh no no bad 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 wink wink we can't sell it anyway to some of the biggest multi-state investors in the united states are people that were adamantly opposed to marijuana the second capitalists start getting money in their pockets that doesn't have the appearance of killing people and the second that the morality which would be this thing is evil and you lose your mind, gets turned on its head to say, this really helps a lot of people through research, through personal stories, through family connections, through the people coming out of the woodwork that have been hiding for 50 years and using this substance. That's what changes these things. Can you talk a little bit about Foucault's, not only his ideas about productivity and that, how that connects in, uh, but also you make a very similar and related connection to Foucault about this switch in the night, the early 1900s, late 1800s, from policing of the external body to the policing of the enemies within, and how we started in the United States, we had the Red Scare. We were locking people up because we thought they might believe communism was a good idea. That sort of thing was all connected with what we're talking about, too. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, lot wrapped up in there. How should I answer that? I think I have a tendency that, to ask way too big questions. So you're yeah, it's, it's, that's a big question. <laughs> Someone could write a book on that. I think. I mean, I'll, I'll start off with something that isn't very Foucaultian at all, but I think it is a point worth sort of talking about a bit. So I remember a few years ago, 
teaching a class about international drug policy and talking about recent developments. And I was describing what was going on in the US with legalization of cannabis, medical and, and recreational. And a student said, wow, this is amazing. I didn't know about this. Why is it happening in America? I would have thought that was the last place it would happen. And I thought, I probably couldn't answer it in the class, but I thought, you know, this is a really good question. And there are no doubt lots of different reasons, different answers you could give to that question. But I think one of the answers that you um, put your finger on is the economic one. There's money to be made in ways that are not going to necessarily cause lots of harms or risk of lawsuits. And so it's a sort of obvious thing to happen that people can see they can make money out of it. And where else would be the epicenter of this than the global epicenter of capitalism? And drug so, use. I mean, honestly, we, we were liars and we are always drunk and on drugs. That's just like, if you really, the reason we got off the Mayflower when we did back in the day is because we were almost out of beer. There was other reasons too, but there's yeah, like but, stories that run through our history that are like, we just have always not. But that's almost the same it. thing though, isn't it? Because sure. what you're describing is, is yeah. consumption. Without consumption, there is no economy, you know? Um, yeah, we're back so, to the So it's sort of different aspects of the same thing. So that kind of rapacious consumption is one of the drivers of capitalism, isn't it? You, you need that. So <laughs> drugs are perfect because they're consumables. So you buy it, use it, and it's gone. Yeah. So it's not like buying a thing, you know, not like if I buy a computer and I can use it for, I don't know, five, six years, right. that's fine. And so you have high, high price for it because it's going to last for a number of years. But imagine being able to sell something and people love it and want more of it. But once you use it, it's gone and you've got to buy another one. You know, yeah. this is, this is perfect. What more could you want? So I think yeah. that the capitalism side of it can't be understated i think that's there's, our way out right now honestly yeah there, there's an interesting question or well, interesting to me at least so i said before about america as the epicenter of global capitalism but you you could argue that in that 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 sort of leadership if you want to call it that is changing globally and that maybe in 20 30 years time the world's economic superpower is going to be China. And what does that mean for global drug policy? Because I would argue that in the 19th century, when the world's global superpower was the British Empire, they were the key players in the drug story. So the opium wars with China, that was really, as I was saying before, that was really a driver of what happened and what created prohibition. And then the 20th century, the American century, some historian, modern historians call it, America was really calling the shots. And particularly by the time you get to, you know, Nixon and war on drugs, you know, they're, they're the sort of leaders of that. Does this mean that if the 21st century is the Asian century and that China is the world superpower, that we're going to have a new phase that we probably can't even imagine right now of world drug policy that is driven by the interests of China and the wider wider region. I don't know, but my speculation is that that is going to be the case, that we're, something yeah. new is going to unfold that no one can really see now, and not many people are even talking about this. A few are in its population and its industrialization and post-industrialization. We're a country that still to this day is struggling with just having tons of kids and being proud of it, and China seems to be moving into the, and they're going to have some issues with that too. But by and large, as we move to robots that can do the work of a thousand people that is safe and your job now is to stay home and make content, these numbers are not going to work. Everybody on the planet can't make content for everybody on the planet. That's the edge of my expertise. We're now moving. Yeah. Into so I, I, I think that's a sort of area to be explored by people. And I think things are going to look very different in 40 or 50 years time. And I just don't know what that's going to look like, but I, yeah. I feel that's important. And I was writing something the other day, just a sort of short blog thing about Thailand. 
Well, I don't know if you've come across this, but they very recently um, in June this year effectively decriminalized cannabis cultivation and mm-hmm. they've just had this sort of explosion of cannabis infused food and drink and a lot of smoking of cannabis although that's in a gray area the extent to which that is legal but it's a sort of really unusual thing that in southeast asia where drug laws are actually pretty strict and use of death penalty and so on that suddenly you've got this one country where there's this incredibly liberal approach to cannabis and i've just speculated in this very short piece on how is this going to play out in the wider region of not just southeast asia but east asia and china and particularly i mean people are speculating that there's billions of dollars to be made in thailand through this and including through tourism and you know people people wanting to go there is this going to actually be the thing that really accelerates change in that region in a way that is sort of unimaginable now? And I don't know, I'm just yeah. speculating again, but it, it feels like there are so many of these things happening and you just... Yeah. Untapped markets do that. And you're right, the historical line is often hard to see from the front side, but we've got countries that exist because oil became something we figured out how to yeah, use and we've so, got other countries that exist or areas that exist as they do because tech became a thing that some people were like that's not going to work so maybe drugs is the next one yeah we might look back and say well what happened with thailand was they got first mover advantage in the, yeah. basically the asian market for legal cannabis it doesn't take long after that for everybody around them to either totally crack down and do what they're doing with russia right now and like looking at a decade plus or something for cartridges of cannabis to say wait there's a lot of money being made over there and a lot of our people are going over there and spending it instead of spending it here it's got to go one way or the other. I'd hope yeah, I think that's right. I mean, uh, Thailand might end up incredibly isolated mm-hmm. and that might then strengthen links between Thailand and the US, or this might have a kind of ripple effect and other people in, in Southeast Asia, East Asia yeah. decide they want to get involved with that market. So I, I think these cannabis is a great example of how quickly when you put it in historical context, how quickly these things change and it's all very much in flux is my sort of increasing understanding of it. You you asked another question, which I haven't answered at all, which I'll I'll have a go at, but it's a bit trickier, which is about the idea of the enemy within and this sort of shift. I mean, Foucault describes it as the the civil war mode of governing. So the idea that you create sections in in your population, in your society, who become the sources of danger or fear, and you do various things to control that. And I think we can we can all sort of see that going on in the places we live. That yeah. definitely happens. That yeah. that is true. Um, Powerful. The the harder question is why. And what does it mean and how, what shapes how that works? And I have less good answers for that. But I suppose one of the sort of obvious things I would say is that those kinds of strategies are primarily about maintaining control. Mm -hmm. So being able to crack down on particular groups has a wider impact in terms of social control again we all see this quite clearly i think where or some of us do where wherever we live in the world that so people might like it that certain groups they might see as disreputable get cracked down on but it's also a way of keeping everyone else in line because you don't want to be in that group you don't want to be one of the people who really gets it hard from the police or whatever the control agency is so it's it's a way of keeping people under control more. With, minimal, with minimal official authorities, because what you really want people to do is just police themselves. So if you can whip this crowd that kind of likes you into a frenzy about that crowd over there, you can send the police home and the crowd will just go take care of the other crowd themselves and guess who's the hero? You. You might raid the Capitol. So yeah. it's, it's how humans work, which is anybody is. that is it not into Foucault might be after this episode so the- like, wait. There's a really sort of um, 
terrible but also everyday example of this if you you go on social media so i'm re- primarily talking about in the uk and i'd be interested to hear if there's a sort of us version of this but there's been a lot of concern about policing and race and i know obviously that's a, that's a big issue in in the us and you see from time to time in the uk somebody will film an interaction between the police and it's typically a teenage black boy getting badly treated by the police and there'll be a lot of outrage online of well you know it's just a 15 year old kid why is he getting roughed up by four people and he's not even done anything and he supposedly fitted the description of something that happened around the block but you know how did he fit the description other than being black etc a sort of familiar story but then what's interesting is the which you shouldn't really do because it's a bit of a cesspit. You look at the comments that come below the line on these things, and a lot of people say, yeah, this is terrible, and it's happened to family members or neighbours, and what are we doing about this? The police are out of control. So that's one sort of strand. So then there's a really horrible strand of outright racism. So I'm not going to talk about that because that's just <laughs> sadly what, what exists. But yeah. then there's a, a sort of another strand, which is, terrible but also interesting which is people saying well why was he struggling why didn't he just do what he was told if if only he'd sort of not made a big fuss it would all have been over in 10 minutes and there wouldn't have been an issue if you've got nothing to hide just comply with the police do what they tell you and i think that's a window into this idea of targeting specific groups is a way of keeping us all under control because it seems there's a whole group of people who think yeah i don't want to get that sort of treatment. So I will comply with everything that um, authorities say. So that that's a sort of just a sort of a kind of everyday example of how that's, that that's social deep. control function works. And how you know it's clearly how they blueprinted the cultures that we both live in is that it works. I mean, it, it those people don't realize that they're policing somebody else and that they're actually making it more likely that the next time somebody encounters a police officer they don't have to call four more officers and pay four more salaries but it doesn't feel that way in real time what it feels like is no this is the way things are and probably have always been and i just want to feel like the stat the status quo like things are the same today as they were yesterday i want to have predictability in my life because the alternative is anxiety and anxiety sucks this is again what Foucault wrote about. It's over and over. It's why I piss people off is people don't really like to hear that yeah. unpacked in such an obvious way. <laughs> so so I think we can see that really quite clearly in society that that is part of this this enemy within this civil war mode of regulation is fundamentally about social control in the sense of maintaining order. I mean, the reality is that police services you know if we if there really was significant disorder of of everybody i mean they would just be overrun you know it's yeah we say, we saw it here in the us 2 3 years ago in city after city where mm. in we're at a new age this is something foucault was really hitting on is that as groups grow you can't help it that things have to change one king can't control a city of 5 million people and if he tries it's going to be corrupt and awful and people will disobey the rules You need a new system. And I think we're living through what is the evolution of the system that, yeah, he identified as just barely budding. We don't really know how to deal with it yet. Unfortunately, grossly, it's like it has to be more of what we're talking about because if there's not enough law enforcement to run in and people are really out of control, then you have to take videos and you have to inform on each other and you have to deal with it after the fact, which is the same system we're talking about. It's It's well shored up. It is built incredibly well. It is. um, And it it kind of works in the sense that revolution is quite a rare phenomenon historically. So societies do sort of survive and maintain in reasonable order with occasional, obviously, outbreaks of unrest and violence and disorder. But broadly speaking, they function and they survive. And it's quite unusual for a society to or a governance system within a society to completely collapse and be replaced by something new. That yeah. does happen, of course, but very rarely. I want to make sure we get to Dr. Marx. So how do you describe Dr. Marx's work is maybe the best way to just open that question. Okay, so this is a really fascinating but important period in 
British drug policy and probably important beyond just Britain. So John Marks was a psychiatrist working in the UK. And in the early 1980s, he um, took up a position in Northwest England as a consultant psychiatrist specializing in addiction. And it's worth noting that at that time, so the early 1980s, Britain in general, but particularly the northwest of England, was experiencing an unprecedented, what people described as heroin epidemic. So this was very rapid spread of primarily heroin smoking initially, but later injection amongst young people, particularly closely connected with people living in areas of deprivation, economic deprivation, so very high rates of unemployment, poor housing, and so on, and much younger people than had previously been using heroin. So that was the sort of context that he arrived into this position. And one of the things that he started to do was to think about prescribing practices. At that time, although historically heroin prescription had been used in Britain unusually, compared to most other parts of the world, but it was used with a very, very small heroin using population. The numbers were tiny, so it was, it was not really a big deal in that sense. When you had this explosion of numbers of people using heroin, the questions about how prescribing should work became quite acute quite quickly. And the mainstream practice in the UK was to prescribe methadone, you know, typically or oral methadone, methadone linked to so that was the kind of key modality of treatment for heroin users. But John Marks took a different approach. And although he's sometimes characterized as just prescribing heroin to everybody, I think it's probably more accurate to say what he did was prescribe in a really flexible way but was prepared to prescribe heroin, in, including in an injectable form, but also um, later on smokable, alongside methadone and diconal and, and other things. So he, I think his practice is best described as, as flexible and led by, you know, his driving motivation was, how can I keep this person attending the service so that we can look after all the other things going on around physical health and yeah. access to welfare benefits and and so on and that it would be a failure if what i do means this 21 year old or 22 year old doesn't come anymore and no one's seeing them and no one's checking if they're okay so he is motivated by wanting to make the service as accessible as possible and keep people in contact with professionals who could look after them. And he talked a lot about, he described, and this, this is what riled up a lot of his colleagues and made him quite controversial. He would say, well, I can't cure this. We know that typically heroin using career might last about 10 years, and then eventually people will, will come out of it, will grow out of it. And my job is to keep them alive yep. during that 10-year period. That's my duty. So I'm not curing anything, but I've sure as hell got a responsibility to do whatever I can to keep people alive and healthy until they get to the point where they're able to move on and, and do something different. And that was his philosophy. So Seems so reasonable. <laughs> yeah, but of course... That was a difficult message for his colleagues to take. Uh, and when I say colleagues, I mean more broadly across the whole country, because drug treatment was based within the health service, and it was psychiatrists largely running the show, certainly initially. And you know, they're medically trained people who see themselves as curing people of things that are diseases. And yeah. so somebody walking around saying, well, all we're doing is managing the problem and nothing we can do is going gonna, is gonna to fix this. We've just got to keep them alive. That was a very 
different and difficult message, I think, for his fellow professionals to take. Yeah. So he was seen as a complete maverick. And he was also, you know, working outside of London. The UK remains a very London centric place. Mm -hmm. And what goes on in London is seen as, you know, the the most important thing. And he was working up in Liverpool and surrounding areas in the northwest of England and doing things very differently. And not only doing things very differently, but talking about it really loudly <laughs> where, to anyone who would listen. So yeah. you can imagine, put those things together. He annoyed a lot of people and a lot of people um, really took against him and made his life very difficult. I feel like um, Foucault is still in the room. He's like, yeah, you mean there were doctors listening, thinking, well, then how can I make this person be a productive, quote, member of society? Because all of the most of, from what you made it sound like in your research here, most of the heroin prescriptions that were handed out, and even methadone for that matter, was handed out with the assumption that the person was going to be on a declining dose and working towards a goal of getting off. And you mentioned he, he said, I don't cure addiction. I'm pretty sure I've heard footage of him saying, I don't treat addiction. You can't treat addiction. He went like this yeah. extra step, which is so yeah. reasonable to anybody that's been addicted to any drug. I've spent uh, two or three years mainline injecting heroin and cocaine. And I, if I would have walked in that office at any point, I would have been like, you're my guy. He also mentioned putting dealers out of business. And I can't for the life of me imagine why that didn't fire some of those productive circuits that are built in. But it seems that that went right over people's heads. And they weren't realizing that people are going to buy it anyway. It's junk that's feeding an underworld industry that can only operate on violence because they can't call the police. Send the dude to the pharmacy. Yeah. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. He did say. I'm not treating this. This is not treatment. What I'm doing is not treatment. It's management. It's management of the issue. And he also, as you're right to say, talked about the role of what he was doing in the context of the local drug market, that this was about taking business out of the criminal market. And he would frequently say, what do you want? Do you want your young people who are going to get heroin by one means or another, if that's where they're at, do you want them to get it contaminated potentially, who knows, from gangsters, or do you want them to get it uncontaminated from me? Yeah. And we started with this, this discussion of your paper about the construction of the word drugs and how these stereotypes and ideas and beliefs and historical arcs all came together and still do over and over to reshape what is a drug and what's not. And this is something that is, I mean, irony in a way that points to how misinformed we are. I saw some of the 60 Minutes footage that's still available mm. online, pretty easy to find. And it seems like a big part of what put him out of business is that he started prescribing smokable heroin that was in cigarettes. And to me, that says people think that smoking heroin, if you just talk to Joe Schmo on the street, they think smoking heroin is more dangerous than injection or they don't understand the arguments. When you shoot something into your vein, it's in you. You can't get it back out when you're taking a hit, two, three, four. But if you pass out and you're smoking something, you build in this safety mechanism that you don't still have another gram of whatever the drug is that's about to hit your system and you're already unconscious. That makes total sense. But it seems like there were these spectacle moments where people were walking in with their own cigarettes because the government would pay for the heroin but not the cigarettes and handing them to a pharmacist and saying, I'll be back in a little while. And then they added that last line, which was, they're also putting cocaine in the cigarettes now too, and people lost their minds. Yeah, I think, I think it was that last thing that really increased the international pressure on the British government that in turn became quite intensely focused on him as an individual. I mean, the Cigarettes is, is an interesting thing because it, it really came from understanding that, in particularly in the early part of the British heroin epidemic, most people were smoking heroin rather than injecting, although it's that probably did stronger change. stronger at the time. He was having a conversation with his, his colleagues about, well, if that's the case, why am I prescribing injectables so much? Can we do anything? Can we sort of prescribe something that actually matches what people want and what they're using and that is also as you say safer it's better you know th this is beneficial 
And so that was how they explored it. And they created this kind of, I guess, relatively primitive way of doing it by it injecting into cigarettes. And- well, how, it's worth adding that extra step because I uh, grew up in a town where there's not much to do, but people always wanted to be what we called hipsters. Like you want to find a hat that people have been wearing for a thousand years, but pretend you just discovered it. So that's your identity. Clove cigarettes, the bane of my existence. They pop and hiss and crack. And it sounds like at first they put these into clove cigarettes because they could get the government to spring for non-tobacco smokables and nobody wanted to smoke them. And you go this far. I, I was thinking the other day, I've been reading Richard de Crampre's book, A Cult of Pharmacology. Oh my God, what a great book. And uh, he's talking about the 90s when we started to realize cigarette companies have been putting ammonia in their cigarettes so that more of, it's basically freebasing. And I don't know if you know, if you thought about this or if you've read anything, but do you know if the, I understand cloves suck. I wouldn't want to smoke them either, but I mm-hmm. wonder if part of the benefit of using a cigarette that maybe was manufactured at that time with those ammonia freebase products made the drugs hit a little bit better. That I don't know, to be honest. What I've been told is that it was really driven by customer preference, if you like, that basically people hated the taste of the herbal cigarettes and said, why can't it just be my normal cigarettes that I smoke anyway? And the the, the funny thing was the pharmacists were okay about putting the heroin in, but drew the line at the tobacco cigarettes and said, no, we're not. We can't provide those. Don't you know how dangerous they are, cigarettes? So the heroin was fine to the pharmacist, but not the cigarettes. And so people had to provide their own. But I think it was it was definitely the cocaine cigarettes that really brought intense heat on John Marks because, you know, the headlines you can imagine were, you know, NHS doctor prescribes crack yeah. <laughs> on, well, on we're taxpayers' first, we're, money. We're full circle, right? Because we've just arrived at like, well, then what the hell is crack? Because it's not even a thing. It's just cocaine mm-hmm. that is actually it's break it's manufactured a little less and it's you can freebase it you can light it on fire without it burning up before the vapor gets in your lungs but crack oh it's a thing and mm. no matter probably no matter where you're at in the world but in the u.s talk about stereotypes that are just doused on top of a, a specific drug that's what they alluded to we all knew that like well i know a lot about crack that i don't know in if that's what's going on over there, ooh, this is going to be terrible. And it makes me wonder if he was actually on to, I don't think it'll be cigarettes, fingers crossed. I don't know what the alternative would be. But when we finally get around to undoing this mess that we're slowly now chipping away at in various areas, if it's going to look much like that, where you're walking in and picking up a prescription and you actually are encouraged to smoke it, maybe as an in-between between when you move to an oral ingestion. That sounds terrifying to people, but what, what yeah, do you think or, that looks like moving forward? Or, or vaping. So obviously, vaping yeah. technology is vastly different now. Maybe that's the the way forward. I don't know. I mean, it's interesting that the cocaine cigarettes, my, my impression is that, I mean, there wasn't a lot of cocaine use in Liverpool and surrounding areas at that time. I think this was just a sort of continuing experimentation of trying new ideas so there were also i think amphetamine cigarettes and you know just trying different things so it wasn't that it was being hugely used or that there was a big local problem he was addressing he was just being experimental and trying different things and that you know the heroin reefers as they called them worked well although you know it's a a very inefficient way of getting the heroin into your system. So people tended to need a relatively small dose of methadone at the same time, just to sort of keep stability and then the heroin reefers in in addition. So he was just trying different things and, you know, doing his best, I think, to manage the problem as he saw it and keep in contact with people. But politically, it became very, very difficult for him. (laughs) <laughs> to say the least, it seems like yeah. he was, um, you make this point too, he wasn't the only one doing it or even the first one doing it. And he did sort of move this mapping of it forward, the idea to say we don't have to force people off their drugs. But he still regulated a lot. You didn't just walk in and get drugs. You walked in and had to sit through a session. He had rules that uh, clearly we don't have a lot of time today to talk about this, so that's fine. But he had policies that played well with the system, again, that Foucault was talking about, which is how are you regulating these people? 
they had to follow rules that sometimes get us methadone. I'm not on methadone anymore, but I was for five years. They get us in trouble. You have to get to wherever the clinic is once when they say, and for him, I think it was once a week. And if you missed more than one or two meetings, they would automatically cut back and you had to sit in a room. And this is the part I love with him and a social worker and then a third person who might be your probation officer or if you got a mental health professional that you're working with that would all come in and just say, hey, what's up? How you doing? And if you were like, give me my hair when I want to leave, you're in the right place. Eventually, when you, if you decide you want to do something different, you'll know exactly where to go. And that's, I think, exactly where we're headed. Yeah. And I, I think you're right to say that you know, it wasn't a completely unstructured or rule-free environment. And some people didn't like it, although his philosophy was to be accessible. Mm -hmm. There were some people who didn't want that or just didn't like the way it was structured and didn't participate. So, you know, you can't, you're not going to be the right thing for everybody, but it, it definitely wasn't a kind of unstructured free-for-all. And, you know, at the end of the day, John Marks was a, consultant psychiatrist in the health system, which is a pretty establishment position in a, in a conventional profession. And yeah. that was a side to him as well, you know? Yeah. The Western media definitely didn't help though. <laughs> it seems like it's the downfall of so many. Yeah. So I, it, it, it sort of burnt itself out is my take on it in the sense that there was a lot of pressure locally and nationally and internationally all connected and, it became impossible and um you know he did it for 13 years which is quite a long time and um it it was never going to last forever one of the really interesting things now in the uk is that there's been a bit of a revival of heroin prescribing but it's it's framed completely differently now so it's called heroin assisted treatment and it's very much described as a as a clinical intervention so when it's evaluated it's randomized trials of effectiveness yeah. it's run by doctors and it it's a kind of a very distinctive and particular framing of what is basically the same sort of thing of prescribing yeah. heroin so i think it's interesting that that's the direction it's gone in you could say that constituency in the profession who didn't like john marx talking about this isn't treatment, this is management, have sort of found a way of recasting it so that it absolutely is treatment and yeah. medical, but it's sort of the same thing. Yeah, I'll take rhetoric anyway. for, yeah, semantics for 2000, please. Yeah, that's exactly what so, I'm talking so about. So it, it's a kind of um, just a, a phenomenon we see, I guess, of people refiguring things so that they're palatable to where they're coming from. That's, that's how it looks. I don't know how it looks in the U S I mean, is it a thing it's at the all? Same. Yeah. It's in right. cannabis was our, our first one that started to get into actual clinical studies. And it's anybody that thinks like, if you read in Foucault, you're anti-system. I mean, you kind of don't have a choice on some things when you see how the gears work, you're like, that thing cuts fingers off. We should fix it. But it's more about just understanding it. And there's where you can see the system and for better or for worse, if somebody's saying, how do we move forward with policy? It helps to be, understand what the hell is going on with this machine that usually has a big cover over it. If you can pull the cover back and say, we just need to reroute some stuff. Cannabis is going to show us how to make people change their minds faster. I had Asperger's as a kid and started smoking what we would have called self-medicating when I was 14, 15 years old. And it worked wonders. I suddenly was social. I wasn't terrified at school. I could engage. I wasn't distracted all the time. And I was a criminal. I went to jail when I, when I was 15 years old before I'm like two days before my 15th birthday. And I knew from that point forward, you're a, a, a drug addicted person and a criminal. So if you see the cops hide out, stay away from them. And that's a powerful motivating force for a 14, 15, 16 year old mm. constructing an identity and trying to figure out who they are. And they have one or two tools that work and they make them a criminal. Now the data that is in multiple studies shows that when you give anybody on the spectrum marijuana, willingly, not without telling them, the vast majority of them within 30 days respond clinically and statistically with reduced anxiety, with mm. better functioning, with better social interactions. If I could have just showed that to my mom 20 years before it existed in 1995, my whole life would have been different. Mm. And I think those data are Foucauldian systems. They're the status quo. You have to show me the study, which is why so often, as you've noticed in your work, 
studies get buried. These fabulous studies get done, and then the companies or the government's like, why don't we just like not let that one come all the way out? Thanks for the, the update and the blurbs. Yeah, I mean, heroin prescribing is a great example of not, not so much the burying of studies, but the sort of amnesia people have about what we already know. I mean, John Marx described what he was doing as a continuation of the British system, which had been going, you know, for decades before, before the war. So he, he didn't see what he was doing as necessarily new. But since then, we've had heroin trials in Switzerland, which actually was, you know, they went to visit John in Liverpool and in the 80s and asked him how he was doing it. We've had trials in the UK in 2010, big set of trials, lots of different countries elsewhere. And yet, in I think this is 2018, yep. I was staggered to see a couple of new schemes, heroin assisted treatment schemes being launched in the UK described as pilots. I think, what what is there to pilot? You know, yeah. you, you may not want this, but we, we know what it can and can't do as a, a way of dealing with people. So this sort of idea that you have to pretend that we don't have a good evidence base right. and say say this is a pilot and then you can maybe get away with something that you might not I'd like to see the do. proposal because you know that they had to refer to all the at least some of the prior research that it, this is a great point you connect throughout the article about Marx which again if you want to read it is linked in the description as well he himself every time somebody would say oh well do you got any data because you know things might change if you, he'd be like you don't need my data I mean I do and there's a hundred years in fact, there's more than that, because in the United States, we've got early data on before drugs were illegal, and they were kind of dangerous because snake oil salesmen would run through your town, and you didn't know how much of what was in it. So we didn't, the initial laws were towards regulation. But at this time, when people could order a heroin-filled syringe from Sears and have it delivered to their door for a buck thirty-two, the majority of drug users in our country were wealthy or uh, well-to-do and had either full-time jobs or connections to social culture, and the vast minority were classified below the poverty level. We had a very different system going on than what we all think happens when you make drugs accessible and easy to get. Yeah, I was, I was fascinated to read a while ago about the morphine maintenance clinics yeah. in the early 1920s in the yeah. US, which is something that you hardly ever see people refer to or write about, but you know, it's actually quite, although for a very short period of time, probably yeah. not longer than about five years, but a lot of clinics set up and a lot of people seen and, and prescribed morphine. And yet we, we sort of almost pretend that never happened. And I don't know, I wish I knew the answer. I mean, it could be as simple as productivity in that when people are told, well, it's got a t methadone and suboxone, their biggest selling points are they kick in really slow and they wear off really slow. So you don't have to dose five times a day. With morphine, you're probably going to have to take a break and go redose. And mm -hmm. if you're at a job, we've built the system so that, oh my God, that guy can't be here. He, he's on morphine. What if he crashes the forklift into the wall and right, mm -hmm. I get sued? Whereas with methadone, we've somehow back to the 1920s, it got, well, it was after that, but it got sort of pulled in under the guise of it works with the system. It increases productivity. It puts money in the pockets of a legitimate group of institutions because now it's also linked to criminal justice, to the courts, to 12-step, to rehab programs, to all sorts of other people that punch, a, or they probably don't actually punch a clock, but they're working in legitimate legal jobs, funneling money into the economy through paying salary or getting paid salaries mm -hmm. and buying stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's um strange old business. Yeah. We could wrap all day. I imagine sometime in the future, I'll get another five or 10 of your articles under my belt and be like, we got to talk again, man, but keep up the great work. It's a blast to read your stuff. Uh, we didn't even have time today to talk about the studies and the, uh, the meta-analysis. You've done a few of them, it looks like now with some groups of other people regarding how different drug use impacts crime. So maybe we can put that one on the shelf and do another one sometime down the road. Absolutely. Yeah. It'd be great to talk again, but Thank you for having me and uh, for having a really interesting conversation. Yeah, appreciate it. That was Toby Seddon, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more from him in the future. Check out his stuff at the links in the description. And until next time, as always, love yourselves and the addicted people in your life.
I'm Ben Boyce. If their uh, drug taker is determined to continue their drug use, treating them is an expensive waste of time. And really the choice that I'm being offered and society is being offered is drugs from the clinic or drugs from the mafia. Cure people? No. Nobody can. Regardless of whether you stick them in prison, put them in uh, mental hospitals and give them electric shocks, we've done all these things, put them in a nice rehab centre away in the country, give them a social worker, pat them on the head, give them drugs, give them no drugs. Doesn't matter what you do. They seem to mature out of addiction regardless of any intervention in the interim. But you can keep them alive and healthy and legal during that 10 years.